Hello, my name is Mihai Pop, and I would like to appreciate the effort made by the IBM members and partners for organizing its, this important conference for all those interested in bears. So thank you guys. I'm glad to have the opportunity to present a short perspective on the conservation projects output and national policy in Romania. So let's start. Romanian brown bear population is part of the Carpathian population. The present range covers also parts from geographical areas outside the mountain ecosystem. Uh, managing the largest bear population in a human dominated landscape is as challenging as preserving small population. Both requires a high level of collaboration between different interest groups, trade policies, and not the less strategies balanced between ecological, social and economical objectives. The last 70 years of the brown bear management in Romania was shaped by the centralized decision of the communist regime that created policy in a framework designed for satisfying a small group of politicians and their entourage. It was imposed from top to base uh, with the purpose of increasing not only the size of the population, but also the quality of the trophies by selective hunting and intensive feeding of bears. Other economical sectors were also forced to consider the bear management objectives, but this is already history. After the fall of the communist regime, the bear became a regular game species with restrictions limited to hunting season. Since 1997, the interest towards hunting uh, and on the species management increased slowly on all group of interest and the increased number of NGOs made the brown bear one of the main topic of discussion. Further, we will uh, focus on the last 20 years because they are more relevant for, for, for us. Joining Bear Convention on 1997 and a new hunting law, the main legal act for the bear management at that time, overlap with the implementation of the first conservation project in the Carpathians. This project, uh, opened a small window in a closed system, sharing the first information publicly on the bear population. Further conservation projects started to be implemented on a principle of testing best practices to promote better policies. The European Union was a key factor for the conservation projects due to the availability of medium and large grants, mainly from life program. Since 2007, the legislation evolved from uh, one pillar, hunting law, to two pillars, hunting law and environmental law. Brown bear uh, become therefore a species of conservation interest and confusion took over the system. Conservation projects results aligned with the European legislation objectives uh, have allowed the public more access to information, raising questions about the past and future, future management. Besides recommendation guidelines, new methods and local success in reducing poaching, mitigating conflicts, improving local knowledge, the conservation projects were criticizing the top to bottom approach for decision-making, promoting a participative and transdisciplinary process with specific ecological and social objective. In political terms, this should have been a revolution. The most relevant conservation projects since 2007 were uh, focusing on topics like population monitoring, conflict mitigation, coexistence, connectivity, and most of them, uh, besides conservations, were tools used to improve the research quality in Romania. Different partnerships were built between research organization, public institution, and NGOs. Nevertheless, the impact of these outcomes was limited to local scales, due to lack of political support for systemic changes to wildlife administration and legislation. One weak point of this conservation project might have been that despite the fact that hunters were considered as a target group for the results, they were rarely involved as partners in these projects. Through time, the results of the projects evolved from recommendation to define new objectives towards new methodology and guidelines to promote best practices, 
covering main topics like population monitoring, conflict management, connectivity. The quantity and the quality of the theoretical results increased significantly also due to the more fragmented international partnership. Improving the relation and collaboration with other international experts is, on my own opinion, the one of most important success of the projects. Nevertheless, social aspects were left behind, mainly due to the fact that most project teams were composed by ecologists, biologists, foresters. This might have been a second weak point in the relation to the policymakers. Despite the financial and some, sometimes logistic support of the governmental institution, during the implementation of the conservation projects, the results were in the best case partially considered most of the proposal for system change being ignored by the authorities. These are some examples of the results that were somehow considered by the administration at national level, but some of them were never considered by the practitioners like hunters. For example, it required seven years and a lot of pressure from local communities due to an increased number of bear attacks to have the first protocol for emergency situation based on a work done into conservation project. It is not perfect due to different interests of public and private organization, but it is a start. Outside the technical discussion, the politician narrative on the topic is mainly covering social aspects that were never covered by conservation projects deeply. The conservation project seems to have failed to consider the emotional parts. Another problem not considered by any party involved is the fact that the Romanian authorities had no mechanism in place to evaluate the impacts of past uh, wildlife policies on brown bear population and habitats. So at this time, it is a game of thrones. Everybody is recognizing the problems and the needs, but no one is ready to compromise in, on objectives and actions. Both conservation projects and policymakers are aware of the need to move forward, but none are ready to negotiate. Explosive context is fueled by the conflict between the NGOs, main beneficiary of the conservation projects and promoters of a new system, and hunters, the keepers of the old system based on bears as resource. Both groups making a powerful lobby at national and international level and maintain the conflicts open. Indirectly, the low involvement of the scientific organization has a huge impact on the quality of the debates. Non-conservation policies or debates can be efficiently efficient without scientific support and guidance. Debates shift from one topic to another, but there are two main topics covering the public agenda, hunting of bears and human bear conflicts. While non-lethal management solutions to alleviate human bear conflicts have been proposed, they have not been implemented uh, due to a rigid legislative and administrative system. Concomitantly, there is an increasing pressure to substantially reduce bear abundance fueled by a political charge climate and a, neg and a negative campaign focus on wildlife damage. Ironically, none of the groups involved in the debates has the solution, but all have a piece of it in a row shape. We believe that while conservation projects can focus on whatever topic, policymakers should have a red line when designing long-term policies that should be resistant to political changes. Our perspective is that both conservation projects and policies should focus to find common points on existence of a clear plan for removal of individuals through hunting, implementation of national scale programs dedicated to reduce conflict, developing a flexible administrative and regulatory wildlife framework and increasing the capacity to evaluate outcomes of policies via cross-sectoral collaboration. We believe this, is, this will allow all groups involved to switch towards a better management of the largest brown bear population on a human-dominated landscape. Thank you for your patience, and if you have questions, I'm ready to answer. Hi, it is great to be able to do these presentations at the IBA conference again. Uh, today, I'm going to share my personal story of saving sun bears, the two decades of journey to conserve these little known bears in Sabah, Malaysia, Borneo. 
Sun bears are found across Southeast Asia. They are listed as vulnerable under the IOCN Red Book listing. They are by far the least known bear as well, as we all know. And then uh, back in 1990s, um, Chris Savind have written uh, this chapters on Sun Bear Conservation Action Plan that published in the, the Survey Status and Conservation Action Plan for Bears. And he stated at the times that the sun bears is the least known of the world's bears. Basic research on sun bears is the highest priority research need. Basic information on the status, ecology, food habits, and distributions of the sun bears is needed everywhere in its range in Southeast Asia. And I was very fortunate to be able to meet him back in 1994 when I did my undergraduate degree at University of Montana under the wildlife biology program. And at the times he was, he came to our class and talked about the project that he has been involved with. And then, uh, and then at the end of the uh, lecture, I said, you know, Chris, I'm from Malaysia, we got sun bears. Do you have any project working with sun bears? And sure enough, he says, yes, he was actually looking for a Malaysian student to do a study on sun bears and I was there. So my life has changed then. Uh, finally, in 1998, uh, I fly to Borneo to conduct my uh, master projects on the ecology of Malayan sun bears. And at the time, there was three other uh, sun bears researchers, including myself. And uh, from this picture, this is a classic pictures of Gabriela Fredrickson, myself and Fuyuki Namura three of the sun bears research students working simultaneously on sun bears and trying to learn more about the sun bears. And then uh, through my study, I managed to capture several bears, uh, put radio collars, and then study the ecology, track them down in the, in the forest. And all of these studies has been fortunate enough to publish and the, and the knowledge on sun bears slowly gained uh, after this work. And then uh, from these uh, projects by myself, Gabriela and, and, and Fuyuki Namura, and we all know that uh, bears are omnivore species. They eat a wide variety of fruits. And then, uh, and because of that, they are very important uh, seed dispersal in the forest. When they eat fruits, they swallow the seeds, you know, like this uh, wild durian seeds are dispersed by the sun bears. And then when they eat termite, they, uh, control the termite population, some termite populations, some termite species in the forest are known to attack live trees. So by controlling the termite, they actually become a forest doctor that can control uh, the spreads of this uh, termite species in the forest. And then uh, sun bear is also known as honey bears, one of the very important honeys uh, or beehive, beehive that they get hold of is the stingless bee, which they uh, build their hive inside a hollow tree trunk. And then by excavating this hollow tree trunk, they create a cavities and then they create the cavities later being used by hornbills and other uh, species uh, as nests as well. So they are very important in the sense of, uh, of uh, and become forest engineer. They also are very important forest farmer by digging for earthworm, they plow the soil and make the soil uh, easy for others uh, plant species to grow. And then they are very important food provider as well. After feeding on the feeding side, decay wood, termite nest, there's always something left behind where other animals in the forest might follow and forage. And then uh, from these studies, we know that the bears uh, also, you know, have a relatively big home range sizes, their activity patterns, uh, the places where they spend the night and sleep and things like that. And then uh, we also managed to document the effects of uh, El Nino uh, that caused the bears suffer from various stages where the fruits in the forest are failing and therefore cause starvations in the forest. And that makes us believe that the, uh, the rainforest uh, uh, productivity in Borneo is actually very, very poor. And sun bear live in such a hard and tough environment in order to make a living. And therefore their numbers are naturally a low density in, 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 in this forest. 
And then, um, yeah, beside the natural uh, food availability in the forest that makes unders uh, naturally low density, they also face tremendous threats from, say, for example, uh, deforestation. Sun bear is a def uh, sun bear is a forest dependent species, and then the amount of forest reflects on the amount of uh, habitat that they have. But unfortunately, Borneo and across Southeast Asia, much of the forest has been cleared. And therefore, sun bear are facing a lot of threats from habitat loss, uh, such as, you know, to oil palm plantations, developments and other human activities. And then they also are being poached for consumptions, for meat productions, for uh, gallbladder as traditional Asian medicines. And all of these gruesome pictures uh, at one time was, was not rare at all. And then uh, I also found out that at some point, sun bears are being kept as pets. So in 2004, I did a survey on, uh, on uh, captive bears across Malaysia and found out that the situations was very bad. Sun bear cub are extremely cute. And because of their cuteness, people want to keep them as pets. And then, uh, and, and of course, you know, the poachers have to kill the mother in order to obtain this, uh, this, this pet. And some, yeah, some of the cases like this one over here, thought uh, keeping a sun bear as pet at home and then she thought it was a dog, you know, so this kind of uh, ridiculous uh, stories come out. So from all of this uh, uh, surveying captive bear, we've, I found out that the situation for the sun bears are actually very, very bad. And therefore the ideas of establishing this uh, center specifically to conserve sun bear come into my mind. So in 2008, together with a partnership from Sabah Wildlife Department, Sabah Forestry Department, and an NGO called LEAP, I founded, we founded the uh, Bunin Sun Bear Conservation Center uh, to conserve sun bear through holistic approach that incorporates improved animal welfare, education, research, rehabilitations. And then over the years, the pillars that we work on also increases that also incorporates ecotourism, community conservations, anti-poaching, uh, in the future, captive, build, uh, captive breeding and, 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 and everything that it takes, you know, to, uh, to, uh, to, to conserve sun bear because all of these uh, pillars are all interconnected. So we have to work on hand on hand, anything that, that we uh, need to conserve uh, bears. So, over, uh, so for the last 13 years, our centers have slowly developed. And right now we have 25 full-time staff and then uh, the center has been divided into several units like environmental education unit, bear care units, and uh, sales and uh, admin and so on. So, so and uh, we are located in Sabah, in the state of Sabah, on our northern island, uh, northern border. So, if you have not visited us, uh, you know, hopefully, when the world is safe to travel, you can come and visit. And our centers occupy about five hectares of land, uh, and then, uh, and then in in yeah, and there are like. 10 different forest enclosures. And these are some of the pictures uh, of, this, of our centers, yeah, and the works. And later I'll introduce you about the works, yeah. So this is our setting. Behind this scenes, all of these are under our forest enclosures. Our centers uh, takes us like six years to build. And finally in 2014, we opened to the public and where public can see the bears can come and visit us, you know, can learn about the bears in their natural habitat. And then we have been uh, working closely with the Sabah Wildlife Department to rescue bear. So far, 65 sun bear has been rescued since 2008. And then currently there are 44 sun bears still live at our center. Uh, we have released 10 different bears, uh, 10 died from uh, various causes, and then two translocated and one was a uh, uh, captive bred. Yeah, so when we receive bears, they come in all different kinds of shape, all different kinds of conditions. Uh, so we have to spend a lot of efforts and try to nurture them, train them, and then slowly introduce them into the forest enclosure where they roamed. Yeah, and that was the uh, animal, improve the animal welfare uh, part. And in terms of our conservation education program, we work with various agency, funding agency, uh, to make our, 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 our education program uh, meaningful and very, very effective. And one of the good thing about having this center is that we can have a lot of uh, school groups, school kids come and visit us. Uh, these are the numbers of the students and teachers and school that visited our center since we opened to the public in 2014. And then we also conduct various uh, education outreach program uh, to 
the school to tell to tell them about this the story of sun bears about these conservation issues of uh, 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 forest and so on and so forth so it's extremely important and then uh, over the last few years we also work with various uh, uh, authors on producing books kids books and also uh, with Sarah, Dr. Sarah Pai uh, she was writing my uh, biography book called Saving Sun Bear uh, if you have not have it yet yeah I strongly encourage you to get it from Amazon or other uh, yeah and then beside the book she also she also and me she and me also work on a series of uh, children's book called Wildlife Wong and the sun bears and the orangutans and you know forthcoming is the Bonin uh, pygmy elephant and so on and so forth so that would be a quite an interesting uh, uh, feature to, to, to tell the thing yeah and then we also work with uh, several uh, university on our research uh, programs. So these are the university that we work on to research partner, as you can see. So, so far, more than 26 research projects has been conducted at Bonin Sunbear Conservation Center. And then, uh, so these are a series of uh, uh, publications that we published over the last uh, few years. There are more, of course, uh, you can go and see. And then uh, we also incorporate uh, volunteers and internship programs to incorporate younger generations to come and involve and work with us so that they can learn the works that we do. And in return, they also can help us take care of the, uh, our bears, uh, build our centers and so on and so forth. Rehabilitations and animal welfare is actually uh, quite a big thing uh, because a lot of the bears that we think uh, have the chance to go back into the wild. So over the last, uh, since 2015, we have released 10 different bears back into the forest. And all of these bears uh, would uh, wear a radio collars and we can track them down. And then uh, right now we are in the process of analyzing these data and hopefully we can uh, 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 publish a few papers on this uh, release and individual about the success and failure of the rehabilitations. Uh, we also do bear translocations. There has been two cases where the uh, conflict bearers get into trouble and the wildlife department translocated them. And then, uh, yeah, and then uh, in a uh, few years ago, we did this, uh, uh, organized this uh, in the National Symposium on Sunday Conservation and Management in, in, in Sabah. And then currently we are working on this, uh, writing the Bonin uh, Sunday Conservation Action Plan for Sabah. Ecotourism is very important because uh, it gendered revenues. After we open to the public, we have a lot of visitors come and visit us and then, um, yeah, and this is something that I call as conservation ecotourism, where one of the products of our educate of our conservation work is to promote uh, 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 tourism and tourism post local economy, generate revenues for the states of Sabah and Malaysia, and then it it enhances the commitment uh, and incentive for the governments to protect wildlife and and and, and wildlife habitat. Our numbers of visitors has been in, in you know doing really well. Uh, as you can see over here, more than 400,000 over the last uh, uh, six years or so until everybody know when the COVID pandemic hit us. So after the COVID pandemic hit us, everything is like uh, back into square one again, and we are right now struggling. So the works that we do is actually quite challenging. It is, uh, although we have some uh, success, but right now with the COVID pandemic, it is challenging. So I hope that with these works that we are doing, we can uh, continue our work and survive this pandemic and give the sun bears a better hope and better future. Thank you very much. And for those of you who want to learn more about our work, please visit our, our website, social medias and so on. Thank you. Bye-bye.